living fully alive in every way. You're listening to Relationship Prescriptions with Dr. Carol. If you could ask an expert anything, what would you ask? What would you like to know? Hi there, friends. I'm Dr. Carol, and this is Relationship Prescriptions. Now, I may not be an expert in absolutely everything, but I love answering your questions. Dealing with the challenges you are facing and having you uh, write or somehow contact me wanting some help with a question or a challenge you face is one of my favorite things to do. Well, not long ago, I recorded a special question and answer session for our online community, the Fully Alive Group. This session dealt with some really tough questions. And I'm going to share those questions and answers with you here on the podcast. In uh, this session, I deal with a question about depression and anxiety, a young man who deals with that every day. A woman asked a question about guilt and the scriptures that she feels weighed down by. For her, scripture are a weight, not a uh, uplifting feeling. And we talk about that. I also address a question for a man who continues to struggle with pornography and how that is impacting his marriage. And then a young lady asks, what can I do in finding a spouse? I talk about all those and more in this question and answer session. So I hope you enjoy these questions from people just like you and the insights we unpack together. The first question comes from a young man, and it's quite a brief question, but it is so full of, of challenges and meaning. He says, I have depression and anxiety attacks every morning. I know Jesus is Lord. I pray all day. My feelings of worry never leave me altogether. Sometimes I wonder if he really loves me, and yet I know he does. What shall I do? Most of the time, when we are addressing something big, such as depression and anxiety. It's usually all of the above. By that, I mean that God created us as beautiful, integrated, whole human beings. You can't separate one part of you from the other parts. You can't separate the physical, emotional, relational, and spiritual parts of you from the other aspects any more than you can separate the flour, sugar, eggs, and salt from a loaf of bread. You and I are baked together into a beautiful, whole, integrated human being. When we are facing something such as fear and anxiety, it's important to know that Jesus doesn't often just zap us with getting from here to there. Most of the time, it's a process that he invites us to walk through. He intervenes. Our lives are absolutely different because of Jesus, but there are also steps we take to cooperate with him in that journey of getting from where we are now to where he wants us to be. The doctor part of me, the OBGYN part of me knows, for example, that when you're dealing with depression and anxiety, there are very physical, biological aspects to that. I deal with women, for example, frequently who struggle with these issues at certain times during their life when hormone changes are much more dramatic. For example, going through menopause or, or right after the birth of a baby. We also know from scientific research that what you eat, the amount of physical exercise you get, the, uh, the sleep that you get, all those very uh, biological factors play into how our brain responds. The output of good and positive thoughts and feelings needs the input of healthy nutrition, healthy exercise, healthy uh, rest, and rhythms of rest. So in dealing with something like depression and anxiety, especially in the morning, number one is optimize your physical lifestyle. Make sure that the things within your control in your physical lifestyle are the best that they can be. Make sure you're eating healthy, nutritious food regularly. When I have gone through certain challenges in my life, for example, after the death of my husband, 
I realized that certain times of the day, I was much more prone to waves of sadness and tears and, and, and depression. Sometimes I would just have to, to stop what I was doing and take a nap or, or, or go to bed and start again the next morning. So whatever it is in your physical lifestyle, optimize all of those aspects that you can. Again, our, our minds, our thought processes also play into this. If you want the output of positive, resilient, godly thoughts and feelings, pay attention to the input. Make sure that the media, for example, that you allow into your mind is uplifting, is nourishing, uh, fills you with uh, whatever is good and true and of good report, as Paul talks about in, in Philippians 4.8. Now, that doesn't mean ignoring very real challenges. You and I do live in a world where there are very real problems. But what I'm talking about is making sure that you regularly fill up your soul with positive nourishment. Jesus makes an infinite variety of nourishment available, but you and I have to learn to feed ourselves. In the physical arena, we know about that with, with physical food. God makes, for example, grain grow in the field and fish grow in the sea, but he doesn't uh, harvest the grain, grind the flour, bake you a sandwich and, and hand it to you, or catch the fish and bake it and put it on your plate. You and I have to find and choose the physical nourishment that we need. It's the same with mental, emotional, and spiritual nourishment. Find the things that nourish and fill you up. And then you will have more resilience to choose the thoughts and feelings that you have. When it comes to depression and anxiety, one of the things that I encourage you to do is learn to tell your mind where to go instead of chasing after thoughts and feelings. The feelings that you have, the feelings of depression or the feelings of worry and anxiousness are real, but that is only part of the truth. Learn to look for the rest of the truth and choose to focus more of your attention on what is nourishing and uplifting the rest of the truth. And then get around healthy people. The people that we surround ourselves with is part of the nourishment that our brain needs. If you are around people who are miserable and depressed and always pointing out the negative, those are the thoughts you will naturally gravitate toward. Choose the people you spend most of your time with. I know for me, that has been something I have had to pay great attention to and put some effort into choosing the people that I spend time with. That's the kind of uh, effort that I would encourage you to make. And then, of course, pray regularly for God's intervention. All these steps are things that you can do something about. Now that doesn't automatically mean that you will never have feelings of anxiety or depression again, or that magically you'll wake up tomorrow and all these things will be perfect. But it does mean that if you invest in the time and effort to, to optimize the things that you can, to take the steps that are within your control and cooperate with Jesus in that way, that you can make great strides in finding the healthy, resilient mind and emotions that God has for you. That doesn't mean never having negative feelings. Jesus had negative feelings when he was here on this earth. Fatigue, loneliness, uh, great stress, but he didn't follow those feelings. He kept following the path that his father had for him, and you and I can learn to do the same. I hope that's helpful. Another question I received, this lady wrote quite, quite a long letter, and I'm going to take some appropriate parts from her letter because it, it, it's quite lengthy, but the parts that I believe will be helpful for us, uh, I've, I've pulled out of this letter. She writes, I think I have a battle of the mind problem. I battle constant guilt. I always struggle with scripture that seems contrary to God's love. 
And then she shares a lot about her life. She grew up in a very dysfunctional home, uh, in part getting away from that destruction and dysfunction. She started dating anyone who would pay attention to her, got married at age 19 to a uh, very unhappy and destructive man. That, married, that marriage ended. She got married again. But that marriage became involved with uh, opioid addiction, post-traumatic stress disorder, and a number of other things. Um, but in the middle of all of this, her biggest struggle has been feeling this, this guilt and that God is not on her side. Here, here's another part that she wrote. Where I struggle most is my anger with life not going the way I wanted it and feeling constantly that I was never blessed. I think sometimes I'm trying to earn my salvation. I have no joy. I always have this vague feeling that I'm on the outside looking in to the joyful Christian dancing with Jesus, but I'm not invited. And then she lists a number of scriptures that seem to plague her mind with, uh, w with this guilt. Um, the places where it talks about we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Um, places where Jesus said in Matthew, in judging between the, the sheep and the goats, the, the good and the bad, he will say to those on his left hand, depart from me, I never knew you. Where Jesus tells the parable about the wedding guest who is thrown out because he doesn't have a wedding garment on. And she closes her, her very uh, anxious filled letter with this. How do I receive God's love so that I don't suffer from these mental torments and can know for certain that he loves me unconditionally? I want to feel free to enjoy this life the best I know how, but I'm, I, I'm not doing anything that would be against my Lord because I struggle with loving him in this way. Oh, my heart goes out to you. First, I want to say that I hesitate to tell you what to do because it sounds from your letter like you've been told what to do all your life, especially in a religious context, in a church context. We know that from, from scientific research, your view of God impacts your well-being. We know from a very large study out of Baylor University, for example, that people who see God as vindictive, as punitive, as out to get you, struggle with much more psychological and psychiatric symptoms. Those people, on the other hand, who see God as on your side, who's there for you, who is for you, we call that a benevolent view of God, have much fewer psychological and psychiatric symptoms. We know that how a person experienced authority as they were growing up, especially how you viewed a father figure, whether it was a biological father, a father in the church, or some authority figure in that way, that stood in the place of God to you as you were forming your God concept as a child. Those tend to be some of the biggest religious emotional hurdles to overcome. So I, I want to acknowledge, first of all, to, to this woman who wrote in, the struggle in seeing God in a positive way because of growing up in the environment that you did. And it seems like repeatedly people in a religious context and people, uh, men, especially in authority have not been on your side, have let you down, have hurt you. And we as human beings struggle to separate our sense of authority that we grew up with from our understanding of God. God knows that he understands that emotional challenge for you. I want to remind you that it is the enemy who is constantly um, trying to condemn you and bring anxiety and guilt and shame. I want to remind you where Paul said 
in Romans 8, 1, there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Conviction from the Holy Spirit and condemnation from the enemy may in some ways seem similar, but they are very, very different. Condemnation from the enemy, from Satan, chains you to your past, shows you the darkness and brings uh, just no hope at all. Conviction from the Holy Spirit points you to your future. It's light and, and up and brings you hope. That is the kind of, of, of spirit that Jesus is inviting you to experience. And that is, that is my hope and prayer for you. If I can make a suggestion, and, and again, I, I want you to realize that religious people telling you what to do is, is not the sense of, uh, of who God is. But I do want to suggest and invite you to bring these thoughts and feelings to, to Jesus himself and ask him to show you how he sees you. That may be quite different than how other religious people have portrayed how God sees you. Jesus said, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. If you want to know what God is like, look at Jesus and ask Jesus to show you how he sees you. And I believe that that will be healing and encouraging to you. I, I hope that's helpful. I have another question here from a gentleman who uh, I'm, I'm going to read a, a portion of, uh, of this, this question. Uh, he has struggled with pornography for some time and keeps trying to, to stay away. And he writes this, I fell. My wife won't allow me to touch her or to see her naked. Without that, I fell again. Just pictures, but I fell. I have no idea how to hold back this raging sexual imagery. I'm sexual to the core. If you have any idea how I can get my wife to share her body with me, please tell me. Right now, I can stay on track for a couple weeks and then I fall off the wagon. I know that you are not alone. And that's one of the first things I want to say to you. Your struggle with dealing with your sexual drives is part of the way God made you. All of us, men, women, young, old, married, single, are sexual beings. Every person I know of who has wrestled with uh, pornography and related sexual challenges and thinks that marriage will be a cure is disappointed. Marriage is not the cure for dealing with pornography or any other sexual issue. Let me encourage you to look below the surface. The answer is to deal with the, the root issues of your sexual drives and to submit them to Jesus. Now that may sound pretty, but it may also sound impossible. Let me encourage you to go on this journey of understanding what your sexual drives are telling you and then to submit that to Jesus. God did not promise that every human being would have a sexually satisfying marriage in this life. But he did promise that with every temptation, he would make a way. Paul talks about a way of escape, a way of dealing with the issue to live as Jesus intended, the most fully human, the most fully alive human being ever to walk this earth. Jesus himself never had sex, but I believe the very same sexual nature that you and I are created with Jesus had as a human being. He knows the struggle and he also knows what it's like to submit that to his heavenly father. So a couple pieces of this that I would encourage you to do at this point. Number one, 
get below the surface and look at your sexual story. Own your sexual story. Every one of us has been sexually wounded. Whether that happened as a child when someone exposed you to pornography long before uh, it, you had any uh, ability to deal with it, uh, whether you were used in some way sexually, whether you uh, were harmed in some other kind of sexual relationship, whatever the, the sexual wounding was, look at that, own that, bring that to Jesus, own your story, share your, so share your story with a safe person, and then invite Jesus into that story. Part of doing that is submitting your sexuality to Jesus every day. You and I cannot deal with these things on our own. The devil knows how strong these hooks are in your brain, and he will keep hammering at that. The answer is not to rely on your wife to meet all your sexual needs, although in a healthy marriage, many of those are met. The answer is to get below the surface to invite God's healing of the sexual wounds, and then to submit your sexuality daily to Jesus. Along the way, a prayer that I would encourage you to embrace is something like this. Jesus, I cannot deal with this on my own. The sexual drives I have are beyond my ability to deal with. So for today, I once again make you, Lord Jesus, Lord of my life and I make you the Lord of my sex life. I submit my sexuality to you just for today. And for today, I determine that my body, mind, and soul will be used only in ways that honor you. I need you and thank you, amen. If you pray something like that every morning and continually bring back your sexual drive, submitting them to Jesus, you can make progress. Let me also encourage you to connect with others. You cannot make this journey alone. God designed us to grow in community. So please, uh, if you need some suggestions of where to connect with other guys who are walking this journey, or if you're a woman watching this and want to connect with other women, uh, let me know, send me a message, and I will be happy to connect you. There are others who are walking this journey as well. One more question that I would like to address. This is from a young lady, and she said, some things are disturbing my mind regarding marriage and love. I am 25. I'm a virgin. I once had a boyfriend, but we broke up because I wanted to stick to my covenant of remaining sexually abstinent until marriage. I pray to God for a life partner who I know he has already made for me, but should I just sit still? Should I not act? How should I approach this matter? Because guys seem to have stopped approaching me. Does that mean I'm ugly? I don't think so. What does wait patiently mean? You are not the only young lady who has wrestled with this or young man. I have lived single for large portions of my life. I was married for the first time in my 40s. I understand what it's like to feel like, is there something wrong with you because nobody seems to be paying me that kind of attention and I'm not in a romantic relationship, what's wrong? So I understand that angst. I also understand what it's like to pray and want God to bring somebody into your life that way and seeming like nothing is happening. A couple things I learned in my own journey and that I have experienced again now that I am living single again after my husband passed away. The first is that getting married before it is right only brings destruction. I have seen that too many times, both as a physician in the women that I have cared for and as, as a minister in dealing with men and women and couples. So taking the time to make sure it is God's answer is absolutely the, the only way that you can have the possibility of a healthy marriage. So don't rush it. In preparing for a godly marriage, if you are not married right now, the thing I would most encourage you to do is to focus on becoming the right person 
rather than looking for the right person. Imagine the kind of spouse, if you're a woman, imagine the kind of husband. If you're a, uh, a young man, imagine the kind of wife, the kind of spouse that you would ideally want to connect with. And then think about becoming the kind of person who your ideal spouse would find attractive. If you, for example, are wanting a spouse who is godly, how are you going to become a person that a godly spouse would find attractive? How are you going to let Jesus grow your character so that that displays in every aspect of your being? If you want a spouse who is full of integrity, who uh, chooses the right, even when it's difficult, then how are you going to become somebody that a spouse who lives with integrity would find attractive? That means you make those same kind of decisions that you determine to choose right, even when nobody else is walking, is watching. And and invite Jesus to keep growing up those parts of your soul that need, uh, that need to be changed. And whatever those characteristics are, focus on becoming the right person. And then be involved in life. Be involved in places that you are giving to others. Not only looking for a potential spouse, but be be involved in places where you are giving of yourself, whether that is in a, in a vocation, in a job, in, a, in, in work life, where you are being productive and bringing value to your teammates or to your employer. Maybe that's volunteer work. Maybe that's, you know, in the church or in some other, you know, nonprofit arena or, or whatever it is. Maybe that's in the creative arts in music or writing or, uh, you know, painting or dance or what, whatever, being, being creative, be involved in life, be somebody who is interesting, uh, by being involved in life. And you will find others more interested in you. If you become interested in somebody else, they are much more likely to be interested in you. And of course, stay close to Jesus. Long before I got married, I heard actually on a radio program, somebody talk about two things that were important in developing a healthy marriage. Number one, study your spouse. And number two, stay on your knees. I believe those things are important long before marriage. As far as study your spouse, study people, learn about people and to be interested in them, uh, to understand people better and then stay on your knees. Those things will do you in good stead. Now, if you have a question about a relationship challenge, you can get your question answered as well. I would love you to send me your questions. I'm going to be doing more of these podcasts uh, addressing your questions in particular. So send them to me. You can do that in any number of ways. Perhaps the easiest is on our website, drcarolministries.com and you can use the contact us page or the podcast page to send me a question. I do my very best to respond to you personally, but also you might get your question answered on an upcoming Q and a podcast session. Now there's something even deeper that I would love to invite you into these questions and answers are things we address very openly in the Fully Alive group. And we have just launched our refreshed, updated online home, fullyalivegroup.com. And I would love you to come visit. Now in the Fully Alive group, we address these kinds of topics every week in video. It's a deeper way than I can do here on the podcast. You get to see me, I get to address your questions, you get personalized contact with me and with other group members as much as you desire. I would love you to come to fullyalivegroup.com and there you can input your email address to get some samples of the kinds of things that we make available, the tip sheets, the question and answer sessions, the conversations with guests, the teaching that I do every month, 
videos there weekly with Fully Alive group members. And I would love to send you some samples of what you can experience inside the Fully Alive group. So fullyalivegroup.com and request the samples of what you can experience as a group member. Thank you again for being part of our podcast family. God cares about your well-being and your relationships. And I don't know that there's basically any part of life that makes a greater impact on your well-being than your relationships. We're going to be expanding some of the kinds of relationship issues we deal with here on the podcast during 2020. We'll be addressing a bit more about parenting, about some different kinds of uh, relationship issues, uh, choosing a spouse, kinds of people that you should rule out to be married to, and some really exciting things about intimacy and communication. So if you haven't subscribed, do that. Wherever you listen to podcasts, subscribe to Relationship Prescriptions. And I always love to hear from you, whether it's a question for an upcoming episode or just to say you're listening, I would welcome hearing from you. I pray for you often, all the time, every day. And until next time, may God bless you. Thank you for listening to Relationship Prescriptions with Dr. Carol. Our purpose is to provide trustworthy resources that help you and others live fully alive in every way as God intended. If you would like to help others experience transformation in their lives and relationships, we invite you to partner with us. Text the word GIVE, that's G-I-V-E, to the number 512-980-1620. Or visit our website at drcarolministries.com forward slash donate to make a one-time contribution or monthly gift. Your financial support allows us to expand our message and to help others. Thank you so much and may God bless you.